the first time I did a trip by sea kayak, my friend and I explored Voyagers National Park in northern Minnesota. It was the first week in October, and we had the park mostly to ourselves. With all the power boats gone and the temperature dipping below freezing at night, it's like the animals weren't expecting to see any more people for the year, and they were all out enjoying the shoreline. As we glided silently along, our two kayaks leaving small wakes behind us in the mirrored surface, we were able to see moose, bear, beavers, and coyotes at close range without them even noticing us. The fall colors were at their peak, and to get the best view of them, we paddled only a few feet offshore. I remember thinking that it was just like hiking, but way better. We could still see the intimate details of the land, but with no load on our backs. And when we got to camp, we enjoyed luxury food that would have been far too bulky and heavy for backpacking. We even had room to bring a small guitar. Paddling not only allows you to explore the backcountry in more comfort than you might while backpacking, but it can also allow people of different physical abilities to travel together in a group. Whether it's grandparents and grandkids, or a group of friends where one person has a mobility issue. My friends with kids have a large triple kayak. The two parents sit in the front and back cockpits, and the kids sit in the middle. And other friends with kids, a bit too young to really enjoy backpacking, take an annual family canoe trip into the Boundary Waters. Paddling can allow you to reach places that people on foot or in cars can't go, making it possible to have a secluded experience even close to a large city. For example, millions of people live in the cities along Chesapeake Bay, but with a boat, you can reach uncrowded beaches and islands. And of course, there's the incomparable serenity of gliding silently over water, looking down at cobbles speeding by or long grasses swaying in the current. When you get skilled, you can even use your canoe or kayak to surf a standing wave in a river. It's just like surfing a wave on the ocean, except the wave stays in one place. So if you're good, and if the wave likes your boat, you can stay on the wave for a long time carving back and forth across the glassy surface, surging forward into the trough, and then sliding back up the face. It's so good. There are some potential cons to traveling by paddle rather than by foot. There's more gear and more expense in acquiring the gear. There are more skills required and more time needed to develop the skills. And there are the objective hazards to traveling over water. We'll cover some considerations for paddling trips, but I recommend that if you would like to get into paddling, you take a course from the American Canoe Association, British Canoe Union, or another provider such as a local university or outdoor center, or a parks and recreation program. An introductory course will help you learn basic strokes, assess risks on the water, practice basic self-rescue skills, and avoid a lot of the mistakes beginners make. You might also consider joining a local paddling club. Many of them host clinics and festivals, message boards for finding paddling partners, and forums for buying used gear. A local paddling club will also be able to suggest trips that would be within your skill level. Before venturing out onto the water, educate yourself about the risks. Water is inherently dangerous. We can't breathe it. And just wearing a life jacket doesn't mean you won't drown. Drowning while wearing a life jacket can happen because of hypothermia. Water can rob our bodies of heat 25 times faster than air, and if we become hypothermic, we might not be able to keep our faces out of the water. Drowning while wearing a life jacket can also happen from being pinned by flowing water against or under something like a tree or a rock. Flowing water exerts incredibly strong forces, and even strong swimmers often can't free themselves if they get swept into or under an obstacle. And drowning while wearing a life jacket can happen from repeatedly inhaling water while trying to swim through large waves, whirlpools, or other river features. And there are many other ways to drown while boating. I won't spend more time on this topic right now, but I do want to make the point that paddling is dangerous, and you should educate yourself about the risks before venturing out.
I don't want to scare you away from paddling. It's one of the most rewarding pursuits I've ever experienced. I just want to make sure that if you get into the sport, you do so safely. When you do venture out on the water, be conservative in your judgment. Part of this precaution happens during the planning phase of your trip. Plan an itinerary with built-in flexibility for unexpected conditions. For example, if you plan shorter distances for each day, then if the wind picks up or the fog rolls in or the river level rises, you can wait it out from shore. And if you have an extra meal packed and give yourself a bit of a buffer before you need to, say, catch a flight, you'll be happy to spend an extra night out rather than trying to push through dangerous conditions to get to the car. And if you've made note of access points, bridges or roads, where you could cut your journey short if needed, it's easier to make the call to throw in the towel if you find yourself too far out of your comfort zone. Another part of being conservative in your judgment involves what you're wearing. Of course, you should always be wearing your life jacket. It doesn't do you much good if you're using it as a seat cushion or if it's not zipped and clipped. Your life jacket needs to fit well enough that it won't slide up over your head in the water. Tug on the shoulder straps to check the fit. As with any safety gear, make sure it's in good condition. The material shouldn't be frayed or sun damaged, and the foam should be supple, not brittle. You should be able to squeeze the foam and have it spring back quickly. In addition to the life jacket, your clothing is an important precaution. We'll discuss clothing in more depth in a later lecture, but for paddling, the guideline is to dress for the temperature of the water, not the temperature of the air. Sometimes this might mean wearing a wetsuit or a dry suit, even on a relatively warm day. This is especially important if the water temperature is below 60 degrees Fahrenheit or if the combined temperature of the air and water is 120 degrees or less. In these temperatures, hyperthermia is a real threat, especially if you can't get yourself out of the water quickly. Imagine, for example, a sunny 70 degree spring day. It might be tempting to wear a t-shirt and shorts, but if the water is only 45 degrees, you'll need a wetsuit or a dry suit to protect you in case you fall in. Wearing a wetsuit or a dry suit in 70 degree weather will feel like overkill. But the good news is that you can always cool down quickly and easily by getting into the water. You'll also need a boat that is appropriate for the type of travel you're doing. Having the wrong type of boat can get you in trouble, as happened to the two German tourists whose canoe disintegrated on a rapid in a remote part of Manitoba, forcing the pair to walk and swim for 11 days through rugged wilderness to reach a road. It can be overwhelming to try to understand specs on boats, and I could dedicate an entire course just to boat design. But to keep it simple, we'll focus on knowing, in general, what types of boats are appropriate for which types of conditions. That will at least narrow down the choices for you when you're getting ready to buy or rent a boat. Then you can start factoring in things like price, durability, and weight. Of course, read online reviews and talk with knowledgeable staff at a paddling shop before you buy any boat. If the only places you'll be paddling are small lakes and flat, easy flowing rivers, you could get away with a recreational boat. Rec boats are generally made out of polyethylene plastic, making them heavy, but durable and able to handle abuse. Rec boats are generally wide and short with a flat bottomed hull, which gives them good primary stability. By primary stability, I mean that on calm water, they won't feel tippy but the trade-off is that they won't have good secondary stability. This means they'll want to capsize in big waves, or if you lean too far over to one side. Being wide and short also makes them slow. If you think you might want to paddle in anything other than a small lake or a slow-moving river, or if you think you might want to do trips longer than a day, you'll need a touring boat. Touring, or tripping boats, can be made out of any number of different materials, polyethylene, ABS plastic laminate, fiberglass, carbon composites, or Kevlar composites, or even wood or aluminum. We won't get into the details of these different materials, 
Just know that each will have trade-offs in cost, weight, durability, and repairability. For now, the most important thing for us to recognize is what all Turing boats have in common when compared with recreational boats. They're better able to handle rough water and the demands of multi-day travel. To do this, they'll be more long and narrow, with either a shallow arch bottom or a V-bottomed hull, rather than a flat bottom. Their greater length and more narrow width will make them faster than a recreational boat. Touring boats might also feel a little more tippy initially, as they might have less primary stability than a recreational boat, but they will have good secondary stability, meaning they'll be able to be leaned on an edge to carve through turns or respond to waves. Kayaks that are meant for touring will take a spray skirt to keep out the water, and they'll likely have large waterproof hatches for gear. Touring kayaks might also have a rudder or a skeg to help with steering. A skeg is a blade or a fin that can be deployed from under the hull on the rear of the kayak. It doesn't pivot like a rudder, but it can make the kayak easier to steer in wind. If you're looking for a touring canoe, you'll also need to decide if you want to do mostly lakes, mostly rivers, or a combination of the two. For lakes, you'll want a canoe that tracks well, meaning it will go easily in a straight line. For rivers, you'll want a canoe that turns easily. Look for the amount of rocker. Rocker is how much the bottom of the hole curves up end to end. A canoe with a lot of rocker, when viewed from the side, will look more like the rail of a rocking chair than the blade of an ice skate. The more rocker, the more the boat wants to turn, and the less rocker, the more it wants to go straight. Each manufacturer measures rocker in a different way. So to illustrate, let's compare three different canoes from one manufacturer. If you know you want to paddle only lakes, you might prefer a boat like this one. With only two inches of rocker, it'll track very well, but you might struggle to make it turn quickly. On the other hand, if you want to do mostly rivers, you might choose this canoe instead. With four and a half inches of rocker, it will turn more easily, but in a wind on a large lake, you might struggle to make it go straight. Or if you love lakes and rivers equally and would like to have one boat that does both well, but not either one quite as good, you might settle on this model. It's three and a half inches of rocker almost splits the difference between the other two. Remember, different manufacturers will measure rocker in different ways. So if you're comparing boats between manufacturers, it's best to compare the boats in person and to actually rock them up and down on a hard surface to see how much they rock. Or better yet, see if you can attend a demo day at an outdoor store where they let you test paddle a bunch of different boats. Once you have your craft, you'll need to think about how much flotation the boat has and whether you'll need to add more. Flotation is what will keep you and the boat from sinking if you swamp with water. Sea kayaks with waterproof hatches have good flotation, as long as the hatches don't leak. Some canoes have permanent flotation chambers added in the bow and stern, or the ends. If your canoe doesn't have permanent flotation, you'll most likely want to add flotation. Canoes without flotation, while they won't sink to the bottom, will not float high enough in the water to be easily rescued. In a lake, a swamped canoe without flotation will be very difficult, if not impossible, to empty of water and re-enter. In a river, a swamped canoe without flotation is more likely to get wrapped around a rock and broken. Added flotation can be anything that displaces water and will securely stay in the boat if the boat swamps. This could include air-filled float bags, closed cell foam blocks, or even food or gear stored in waterproof bags. As long as it is waterproof and weighs less than a comparable volume of water, it'll work for flotation. Whatever flotation you choose, make sure it is securely attached in the boat. This might require gluing D-rings onto the hull for lashing. Before doing this, make sure you're using a glue that is compatible with both the material of your hull and the material of the D-ring. This is tricky to figure out, 
So talk to a reputable outdoor store for advice. When loading gear into the boat, work to make the boat trim or level from bow to stern and from side to side. Part of this calculation includes the weight of the paddlers and where they'll be sitting. For example, if you have a very heavy paddler in the stern and a very light paddler in the bow, you'll want to put the heavier bag up near the bow paddler to help even out the trim. If one end of your boat is significantly lighter than the other, it will catch the wind, making it difficult to steer. I was once canoeing with students on Lake Superior in 23-foot Voyager canoes, five people to a canoe. On one four-mile crossing to an island, the wind unexpectedly picked up from our 10 o'clock position. My co-instructor's canoe was bow light, and the wind grabbed the bow, swinging it to the right like a weather vane. He tried to correct the heading by prying the stern back, but the raised bow was caught in the wind and wouldn't allow him to correct the heading. They ended up blowing sideways, far off course. From my vantage point, I could see that the problem was the light bow. I chased them down and shouted for one of the students to move farther forward in the canoe to balance out the weight. Once the canoe had a more level trim, my co-instructor was able to maintain the heading. We all eventually made it to the shore. It would be better, of course, to check the trim before leaving shore. You'll also want the boat to be as aerodynamic as possible. In a canoe, rather than having packs sitting upright, try to lay them down so there's less sticking up above the gunnels or sides to catch the wind. In a sea kayak, try to avoid strapping any gear to the decks. Keep it all in the hatches or tucked behind your seat in the cockpit. The final thing to remember while loading a boat is to make sure you can get out of the boat quickly and easily, even if it's upside down. Avoid any loose straps, ropes, or non-locking carabiners that could snag you, trapping you in the boat. If you're in a sea kayak with a spray skirt, practice a wet exit where you flip upside down, release your spray skirt, and slide out of the boat. Of course, before trying a wet exit, you'll want to have another person near you to help if you have difficulty. And every time before paddling, double check that your spray skirt's grab loop is out and accessible. As you paddle, if you need to shed a layer or get out your snacks or water bottle, make sure that you re-stow everything in its place, ideally inside of a hatch or a bag that is attached to the boat. If your boat tips over, this avoids what boaters call a yard sail, where all your gear is floating away without you, or worse, sinking to the bottom. Now that we've talked about boat selection and loading, let's discuss considerations for trips on different types of bodies of water, rivers, lakes, and oceans. Each different type of water body has its own hazards. We'll cover some of the basics, but make sure you educate yourself about the risks specific to the places where you'll be boating. Obviously, not all rivers are of equal difficulty and danger. The international scale of river difficulty classifies them on a scale of one to six. Finding out the classification of the river is the first step to deciding if it's a good river for you. If you're just getting started, I'd recommend that you don't venture above a class one river. Class one rivers have fast moving water with riffles and small waves. There are few obstructions and the ones that exist are easily missed with little training. Or, perhaps, if you've had a bit more training and practice, you might feel okay with a Class II river. Class II rivers have straightforward rapids with wide, clear channels, which are evident without scouting. Occasional maneuvering may be required, but rocks and medium-sized waves are easily missed by trained paddlers. Check guidebooks and websites to find the class of that particular river. But don't stop there with your research. The difficulty of a river can change dramatically with its water level. A river that is typically class one can become deadly in high water. Or on the other extreme, a river could be so low that you wouldn't be able to float it. For some rivers, you can find flow information on the website of the USGS, or US Geological Survey, or on the website of American Whitewater. 
For others, you may need to ask a local outfitter, call a power company that operates a dam on the river, or check a local message board. Even if you've done your research in advance, be willing to change plans when you show up at the river if it looks like it's in flood. Lots of debris floating down the river or water up and over the banks into the trees is likely a sign that the river might be potentially unfriendly. Rapids aren't the only hazards on rivers. Strainers are anything like a tree that has fallen into the current that lets water through but will trap and hold a solid object. Boats and swimmers can be pinned against a strainer and pulled under the water. Undercut rocks can also pin and hold a boat or a swimmer. Low head dams or weirs can create deadly currents downstream that can trap boats and drown swimmers, even strong swimmers who are wearing their life jackets. And people who stand up in fast moving water can get their feet stuck between rocks and be unable to free themselves because the force of the water is pinning them in place. Taking a training class with a whitewater school or club will help you learn how to avoid these hazards. Lakes have a different set of hazards, mostly having to do with wind, waves, and cold water. If boats swamp far from shore, you can end up spending way more time than you'd like in the water. Before boating on a lake, research the local wind and weather patterns. Plan your route to stay close to shore when possible and to minimize crossings. If you're paddling in a group, keep your pod of boats close to each other. This will allow you to raft up for stability or to assist a boat that is swamped. Know what to do if the wind does pick up during one of your crossings. Orient your boat to the waves so it's not being hit broadside. Ideally, you can quarter the waves, aligning the boat so the waves hit just slightly to one side or the other of the bow. If you're in a canoe, drop to your knees to lower your center of gravity and increase the stability of the boat. If the boat starts to feel unstable, keep your hands on your paddle and keep paddling. The resistance of the paddle against the water will give you something stable to hold on to. Then keep loose hips and let the boat move underneath you with the waves. This may take a bit of practice. Most beginners, when they get nervous, stop paddling and get rigid and tense. This makes their center of gravity more likely to be thrown over the side rather than staying in the boat. Just remember to breathe, relax, keep loose hips, and keep paddling. Practice rescues and techniques for re-entering your boat. In a canoe, this could include a boat over boat rescue or a variety of solo re-entry techniques. In a kayak, this could include non-swamped boats rafting up with a swamped boat and helping the swimmers back into their boat, or using a variety of solo re-entry techniques. These rescue and re-entry techniques are difficult, even in flat and calm water. And of course, flat and calm water is not where you're going to likely need them. So practice them, but don't rely on them. The best choice is to be conservative with your route and decisions about when to make crossings so you don't get caught in the wind and waves in the first place. Ocean travel takes all the hazards of lakes, wind, waves, and cold water, and adds a few more to them. Tides, fog, and shipping lanes. Research the area where you'll be paddling. Know not only the timing of the tides, but what hazards they might create, like standing waves or whirlpools. Obtain all the safety devices required by the Coast Guard or the local authorities. These most likely will include a VHF radio and a variety of signaling devices like flares, air horns, and smoke signals. I also attach a strobe light to my life jacket and keep a long floating emergency signal banner in my pocket. If there are large ships in the area, consider getting a radar reflector as well. Sea Kayaker magazine compiles accident reports and analyses into books. Reading these can help you learn from others' mistakes so you can be better prepared. And finally, let's talk about keeping your gear and your body in good condition while on a paddling trip. Of course, you can spend a lot of money on expensive dry bags. These work very well, especially when they're new, assuming you close them correctly. The clear bags make it easy to find your gear, 
but they aren't nearly as durable as the opaque bags. Dry bags with a silicone zip closure will be more reliably dry than the bags that roll down and clip. If you have something like a down sleeping bag that really, really needs to stay dry, consider lining its stuff sack with a plastic garbage bag as an extra layer of protection, just in case the dry bag leaks or isn't closed properly. If your phone isn't waterproof, you'll also want to consider buying a waterproof case for it, rather than relying on whatever dry bag it's in. If you don't want to spend money on dry bags, or if you want to cut down on the amount of gear you own that has a single purpose, you can just line your other bags with trash compactor bags. If you are careful to not get a puncture in the plastic by not putting sharp or hard-sided things inside of it, it should last for many trips. I use trash compactor bags as a liner inside my expedition-sized backpack on extended trips on whitewater rivers. I've had the entire canoe swamped with water, but everything inside the plastic bag has stayed dry. I've even had students wrap their canoes around a rock in a whitewater river, sinking the packs in the rushing water, and everything stayed dry with this method. I do this by placing the empty pack liner inside of my pack and then packing all the soft goods, like my sleeping bag, clothes, and other things inside. I then push out all the air and gooseneck the top of the bag by twisting it and folding it over on itself. I then cinch the twisted bag closed using a clove hitch in some pea cord. We'll cover how to tie the clove hitch in a later lecture. For packing gear inside the hatches of a sea kayak, I prefer to have numerous smaller bags rather than a couple of larger bags. This makes the gear easier to fit through the hatch openings. If I'm confident that my hatch covers don't leak, I forego buying expensive dry bags and just line my nylon stuff sacks with plastic bags and then roll the tops of the bags over and shove them down inside the stuff sack. Things that don't need to stay dry, like pots, pans, dishes, utensils, tent poles, cans and bottles, just go inside a nylon stuff sack or pack, not inside a dry bag or plastic bag. They have sharp and hard edges that will damage anything designed to keep gear dry. My one recommendation here is that if you are bringing canned food, you take off the paper label and write the ingredients with a permanent marker directly onto the aluminum. When cans get wet, the labels fall off, and it's not really fun to accidentally open a can of beans when you're trying to make a peach cobbler. When you're in camp for the evening, or even stopping for a lunch break, make sure your boat is safe. If it's not tied up, it could float or blow away when you're not looking. If it's rubbing against a stick or rock as it's floating, or even if it's just gently rocking back and forth on something hard, it won't take long for a hole to wear through the hole. Your boat will be safest when it's completely out of the water, well away from the water's edge and tied to a tree. A canoe will be best protected when it's upside down, resting on one gunnel. A sea kayak will be best protected when it's placed on two smooth logs, each under the bulkheads between the cockpit and the dry hatches. In addition to protecting your gear, you'll want to protect your body while paddling. The most common injuries while paddling are overuse injuries. Keep a loose grip on your paddle and make sure you're using proper paddling form Again, this is where taking a course will help. Also, when lifting a boat, make sure you're lifting with your knees and not your back. The amount of gear, information, and skills involved in paddling may seem intimidating at first, but I believe it's worth putting in the time to learn. It's an art, and as with any art, once you start to master it, you'll find fulfillment and pride. And of course, there's the payoff of getting away from the crowds and into the solace of nature in relative comfort and luxury.